Jets. Well, I know, I know, right? I mean, we know the story, so what else is there? Okay, well, as soon as I can, I'll be out of there, okay? All right, I'll see you later. Okay, bye-bye. quite a risk. I read a 
this demand for this vote almost destroyed the convention, that people were really quite upset. And are. But women's suffrage was moving to attack the stronghold of the fortress, the one that. Can you remember what you said to them? Well, I began by saying I felt the time had come for the question of women's rights to be laid out before the public. And I did feel that women themselves must do the work, for only women can understand the hardness of death, the length and breadth of her degradation. Isn't degradation too strong a word? No. Well, but I mean, you know, it, it just seems that it's, it's very strong to put down degradation. You have to it's realize that a, at this time, a very woman suffered a civil death. She could not own or inherit property or sign contracts. If she went to work, all of her earnings belonged to her husband. Nor did she have any legal right to her own children. In order to address these wrongs, she had to have the right to vote. Yes, but her own children, she had no legal rights to her own children? Yes, and add this, her husband decided where and how they were to live. If he took a notion to move out where she had to follow and live under whatever condition she found. I see by your letter requesting our presence that you plan to interview Anna Howard Shaw. Ask her about her move to Michigan. Oh, <laughs> I definitely will. Uh, now, before you go, though, tell me, please, about your friendship with Susan B. Anthony. Early on, Susan was involved in the temperance group. So even when I first met her, she knew about organized schools. I persuaded her to take up the cause of woman, and we became a match. She could do something so much better than I. <laughs> Here is a letter. Part of the letter I wrote to you. I will gladly do all in my power to help. Come and stay with me, and I will write the best lecture I can for you. I have no doubt with a little practice you will make an admirable speaker. As for my own address, no one may wish to share the odium of what I may choose to say. If so, I'm ready to stand alone. I never write to please anyone. If I do please, I'm happy. But to proclaim my highest conviction of truth is always my sole object. We were friends for many years, over 50 of them. Toward the end, we differed on strategy. But well, can you tell me about that difference between the two? Well, in general, it was about what tactics we should use to gain outside support for suffrage. Susan felt our drive should, should be isolated from other political developments, but I felt that we must be part of the most radical and democratic political forces. This uh, division split our organization. your uh, revision of the Bible. It wasn't bad. No. We just studied it critically and made a few recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> but you did want to change the Bible. Isn't that a bit presumptuous? Impossible. 
impossible for a man to rewrite the Bible. When women protest against her simple and political degradation, she was referred to the Bible for an answer. When she protested against her equal rights in the church, she was again referred to the Bible. This led to a general and critical study of the scriptures. <laughs> Let us remember that all reforms are interconnected, and whatever is done to establish one strengthens us all, and we will stand up and fight for suffrage. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Stanton. I believe that we're out of time now, but you know, you have given me much to think about. I thank you for coming. are determined to be very inclusive in the movement. Now, I understand that you actually voted long before the 19th Amendment was ratified. How were you able to do that? That is correct. I voted in November 1872, though some called it illegal. I have the transcripts of the trial right here with me. I have been determined for three years to vote in the first election when I had been home for 30 days straight, as stipulated by New York State law, I believe the 14th Amendment gives women the right to vote in federal election. All persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States, and citizens are entitled to vote. In addition, New York State had no sex qualifications for voting so it did not forbid us to vote. 
sue each of you personally for large exemplary damages, and I know I can win. I have any amount of money to back me, and I will take this to the full depth the courts will allow. Supervisor Warren allowed to let the women take the oath of registration. It took a full hour of debate, but they let us register. And as I wrote Mrs. Stanton four days later, I voted. The Republican ticket straight at 7 a.m. The Democratic paper had come out against us strong, and that scared the Democrat on the voting board. He didn't want us to vote or put our vote in the box. But Inspector Marsh said, go ahead and let them vote. And Inspector Jones said, go ahead. But we will be fighting it out all winter. Oh, my. Now, there must have been some repercussions about your putting in the ballot. Uh, yes, there was a trial. It was a true farce. I was not allowed a word of defense at any time. But at the sentencing, the judge asked if we had anything to say. I stood up and said, Judge, in your verdict of guilty, you have trampled upon every principle of our government. My natural rights, my political rights, my judicial rights, my civil rights, all alike have been ignored. And the judge said, the prisoner must sit down. I will not allow a rehearsal of arguments. But I ignored him and went on. <laughs> Your justice will not deny me this one and only poor privilege of protest against the high-handed treatment of my rights. May it please the court to remember that since my arrest in November, neither I nor any of my disenfranchised friends have been allowed a word before judge or jury. The judge said, the prisoner must sit down. I will not allow this. Judge, of all of my prosecutors, not one is my peer. They are my political sovereigns. And if you had put my case before a jury, as clearly was your duty, I still would have just cause of protest. Not one of them, asleep, sober, or drunk, not one of them is my peer. They are my political superiors. The judge tried to interrupt me, but I went on until I had finished. And then I sat down. <laughs> Oh, very good. Thank you. 
And I have here in my notes that I was talking to a friend just the other day. I told her I was going to interview you. And she said, oh, she was born an activist. Do you believe that you were born an activist? Well, I felt that one better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. And my father was very, very interested in local politics and active in local elections, although he never ran for office himself. My mother was interested in education, and she wanted to learn to read so that she could read her Bible. Um, and she went to school with us. It was about 1866 when a black minister from the North founded Shaw University in our little town of Holly Springs, Mississippi. And they offered instructions at all levels, including elementary. So my mother went with us. We all went together. Oh, that must have been a sight. A mother and children all going to school together. Yes, it was. And it was about 1878, um, yes, exactly 1878. I was visiting my grandmother. I was 16 that summer. And word reached us that my parents and <coughs> my youngest sibling had all died of yellow fever. And I was encouraged not to return. But being the oldest of six surviving children, it was impressive on me that I should return and take care of them. So I did. I made myself look older. I got a job teaching about six miles away. During the week, my friends and relatives helped me care for the children. And I would come home on Friday afternoons on the back of a big old cube. I would do the cooking and cleaning, taking care of the children, and on Sunday afternoon, I would go back to my country school. That must have been very difficult at your age, and, and active enough for anyone, but uh, is it true that uh, when your brothers and sisters were older, you all went to Memphis? Well, my youngest sibling, my aunt, um, about four years later, that my aunt became a widow. And she had younger children. And she invited me and the youngest girls to come and live with her, where I took a job at the Shelby School System teaching, and the pay was better. And that was where the famous, or, or rather infamous, train incident occurred, correct? The train incident. Yes. One day when I was returning to my school, I decided to take a seat in the first class coach was the white section of the train. And the conductor told me I had to return to the Negro section. I refused, and he tried to drag me from my seat. But when he took hold of my arm, I sank my teeth into the back of his hand. <laughs> and he took off, grabbed, and came back with the baggage man and another man. They succeeded in pulling me from my seat. And of course, they were cheered on and encouraged by the white ladies and gentlemen, um, particularly applauding the conductor for his brave stand. Well, then what happened? Well, when I saw that they were determined to, to pull me out and, and put me in the Negro section, I offered to get off at the next station. And I did. And through all of that, I managed to hold on to my ticket. Well, Although the, the, the sleeve was torn from my duster, I was not physically hurt. That was an ugly experience, though, and, and was that the end of it? Oh, no, no. I went back to Memphis, and I sued the railroad, and I won. <laughs> A judgment for $500. But the railroad appealed the decision, and they took it to the Supreme Court of the state of Tennessee. The judgment was overturned on the grounds that I had provoked the incident and I had to pay damages. How grim. 
Yes. Was there anything good that came of that lawsuit? Of course, yes. I wrote an article for The Living Way, and the editor liked it so much that he wanted me to write others. And I did. I began a weekly column called Iola. I had, I had an instinctive feeling that people who had little or no school training needed something coming into their home on a regular basis, a weekly basis, that would deal with their problem in, in simple, helpful ways. So I wrote in just plain common sense ways on things that concerned our people, I see. race and politics. And then you eventually bought the newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech, became its editor. Um, and in that paper, you criticized the inferior black schools. Yes, and I lost my teaching job. <laughs> but by then, I was speaking all over. I was speaking not only about the schools, but I was speaking about the lynchings. It was while I was in Natchez, Mississippi, speaking, that three of my friends who owned a very prosperous grocery store were murdered. Murdered. Then, of course, I wrote about that. And two months later, when I was in Philadelphia speaking, my newspaper office was attacked by a mob. and destroyed and I was warned against returning to Memphis. But I did return to Memphis. And that didn't stop your speaking did not out. Stop me, no. In fact you went to England, didn't you? I did go to England. I was uh, invited to speak to the English people about lynchings. And while I was there I lectured uh, all over the country and I organized anti lynching societies there. You're best known for your writing, especially about lynchings, correct? Yes, I wrote 12 books on that subject. And tell me, what is it about uh, the lynchings that perhaps modern day folk don't know? Well, Over 10,000 Negroes, men, women, and children were murdered in one decade. One woman was put in a barrel, spikes driven into the sides of the barrel, and she was rolled down the hill until she was dead. It was Marlboro in the South. I was set, it was set up, it was always a set up. It was once a telegram was sent to a Chicago newspaper describing a lynching 10 hours before it took place. You mean these were planned? I, I thought it was just part of mob rule that they just kind of got out of control and I had no idea. Well, that's why I wrote because people needed to know. You were also an advocate for women's right to vote. How did that occur? Well, you know, I believe that we should defend the cause of right and fight against injustice wherever we see it, and we can do it best if we are organized. So, I organized the first black women's suffrage club. It was called the Afro suffrage club, and that was when Miss Anthony approached me and asked if I would speak at a public suffrage meeting, and I did. And at the close of my address, one man stood up and sneeringly said, if the Negro is treated so bad in the South, why don't more of them come North? Well, before I could answer, Miss Anthony sprang to her feet. She says, I'll answer that question. Because we, in the North, do 
do not treat the Negro any better than they do in the South, comparatively speaking. Then she went on to tell the story about little Rosa. Little Rosa was a Negro girl who wanted to go to the school dance. So she asked her mother for a dime, and her mother gave her the dime and put her in her best dress. And when she went to give the teacher the dime so she could enter the room where the dance was being held, the teacher looked at her and said, Why, Rosa, we didn't mean you. I think a lot of people agree with you, but they don't know what to do. I'm sure they do. I say do something. We should do something. Look, one day when I was living in Chicago, I, I did eventually leave Memphis. My husband came home and he told me that the Chicago Tribune was laboring to abolish the mixed school system. Now I asked him, what, what are we going to do about it? And he said, what can we do? And I said, that's exactly what we should find out. Because there must always be a remedy to wrong and injustice if we just look for it. Do you remember when I asked if you were born an activist? Like, I truly think that you were born an activist. And I'm so grateful that you came this evening to talk to me. My pleasure. Well, it says here, you were an undergraduate at Albion, and while there, 
there was a Methodist Episcopal elder who was eager to have a woman ordained. So you went to the Boston School of Theology, you were licensed there, and then you came back here to the Michigan frontier to preach. Can you tell me more about that? My class in theological school consisted of 42 men and my unworthy self. <laughs> And I hadn't been there an hour when I realized that women theologians pay heavily for the privilege of being a woman. I rarely entered that classroom without the abysmal conviction that I was not wanted there. <laughs> On one occasion, I came across this Bible story of our the <clears throat> people said that the, the uh, Christians were drunken and Peter defended them, saying, these are not drunken. This is the fulfillment of the scriptures of your own prophet, who said, I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. I innocently said to the professor, what does prophesy mean? He said, well, it depends on where it is used. In the New Testament, it is used wholly to mean preaching. Oh, I said, then women did preach at Pentecost. He was bitterly opposed to women preachers and did not want me there. Oh, no, no, the women talked to each other, he said. <laughs> and what did the men do? Well, they preached. I said, but the two of them are connected by a conjunction, and men and women. So the women talked and the men preached? Is that the way it went? He said, we shall resume. Oh, you certainly didn't convince him. <clears throat> you know, my own grandmother could relate to some of this. She was a feminist back in the 1980s. And um, she had something to do with the equal rights in the republic. Mm. Now, one of two things is true, either a republic is a desirable form of government, or it is not. If it is, then we should have it. If it is not, then we ought not to pretend that we do have it. The difficulty is that the men in this country are so consistent in their inconsistency, they have been unaware of having been inconsistent. <laughs> because their consistency has been so constant, it has been there since the beginning of our country's life to the present time. I guess so. Well, if those who are opposed to women's suffrage say that if women should vote, they will have to serve on juries, and would we like to have women sitting on juries? Huh, I have seen some juries that ought to be sat on. <laughs> <laughs> you read in the paper. You read the other day that a little girl went to school and never came home. Another little girl was sent on an errand and never came home. Another little girl was not at home when her mother came back from work. You read it over and over again, and the, it strikes you as appalling. Don't you think that the vampires of this country who fatten and grow rich on the ignorance and innocence of children would rather face Satan himself than a jury of mothers. <laughs> I'm sure they would. I am sure. But we need to get back to what happened to you after uh, you became a preacher, or rather a talker, as your uh, professor would have said. My most dramatic experience occurred in 1874 when I was to preach at a northern lumber. I could only reach my pulpit by having someone drive me through the woods all night. After I made several vain attempts to find a driver, a man did appear in the two-seated wagon and offered to take me. I felt I had to go, though I did not like his appearance. It was getting late, and before long we were out of the settlement and in the woods. Suddenly, he began to talk, and at first I thought I was rather glad to hear the reassuring human tones. But then he began to tell great
grim stories with horrible details, I soon realized he was deliberately affronting my ears. I told him I would have none of that talk. He answered in shocking vulgarity, stopping the horses so that he may turn and fling his words into my face. He snarled that I must think him a fool to think that he did not know what kind of a woman I was out there in the woods with him alone at night. I tried to remain calm. You know perfectly well who I am, and you understand that I am making this journey tonight so that I may preach tomorrow. He snarled at me. Well, he said, I'm damned if I'm going to take you. I've, <clears throat> I've got you here, and I'm going to keep you here. I slipped my hand into the satchel on my lap and touched my revolver. <laughs> I drew it out and cocked it, and as I did, he recognized the sudden click. Hey, what do you got there, he said. I have a gun, I said as steadily as I could, and it is cocked and aimed straight at your back. Now drive on. If you stop again or speak, I'll shoot you. Well. The rest of the journey was a black nightmare. But the, we, he neither stopped nor spoke. The next morning, I preached, and the rude building was packed to the doors with lumbermen who came to see the preacher who carried a pistol. <laughs> <laughs> you have certainly led an interesting life, that's for sure. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to include in this article? If you have a bit of truth, <clears throat> let nothing take away what God has given you. Let no obstacle, no opposition, no scorn, let nothing extinguish that flame. Hold it high. And if the world lags behind, hold it still higher. Get the world to come up to your truth. Never let your truth come down to the world's level. Certainly sounds like good advice, and I'm sure that that's what you did. Well, you had a huge opportunity to spread that word when you were the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Organization. Tell me about that. Well, that's what we were all there for, and that's what we tried to do. You did a great job. I mean, I wouldn't be able to vote if it weren't for you. You have your own tests. Look around. You're going to find them. Well, I suppose so, but you know, times change. And, well, I imagine you're going to tell me that times don't change, that people change the times. So. You said that. I didn't. But I think that you are right. Mrs. Shaw, I really wish to thank you for coming this evening.
here in America, everything belonged to the husband. So I resolved to change that. And how did you go about trying to change that? I started writing petitions and sent my first one to the state legislature in New York. It was 19, oh, this is both, 1836, the same time that Thomas Rattel had submitted his first Married Woman Property Act. It was a lot of trouble to just get five signatures on my petition. The women said, the men will laugh at us. Others said, we have enough rights, enough. The gentlemen, they said, women have too many rights as it is. <laughs> I did not agree. I continued to send petitions, but with increasing numbers of signatures until 1848-49, when the New York legislature finally enacted a law that gave called the queen of the platform because of your skill in speaking. Most people don't know that English is not your native tongue. We are not contending for the rights of women in New England or Old England, but of the world. Well, I understand that you're credited with bringing the suffragist message to Michigan. The last I knew, Michigan was part of that world. But there is no reason against women's elevation, just prejudices. The main cause is a pernicious falsehood propagated against her being. Namely, that she is by nature inferior. But inferior in what? What has man ever done that woman, given the same advantages, could not do? In an intellectual sphere, give her Give her a fair chance before you pronounce a verdict against her. Cultivate the frontal part of her brain, the same as a man, and she will be his equal at least. Even now, when her mind is called out, her intellect is as bright and as capacious and as powerful as a man. I certainly agree with that, all of that. And yet there are men and women who do not agree, and they say they value freedom. But freedom does not come from the sky, like a meteor, and it does not bloom in one night. It does not come without great efforts and great sacrifices. All who love liberty need to labor for it. And silence, when life and liberty is at stake, whereby a timely protest could stay the destroyer's hand 
do that now. There was another part of the struggle, and I understand that you and Susan B. Anthony saw eye to eye on the question of poverty. Yes. She was quick to see that, that poverty played a part in almost all oppression. And to see the misery in our midst, which is not caused by not having enough, but owing to its misdirection. I, I suppose that you would grant that woman is a human being. If she has a right to life, then she has a right to earn support of that life. If a human being, then she has the right <coughs> to have her powers and her faculties developed. And if developed, she has the right to exercise them. And that is what you are doing right now, and that is what I am doing. Yes, I am. But we labor under great difficulties. Not long ago, I observed an account of two offenders that were brought before a justice in New York. The first offender was accused of stealing a pair of boots, and his sentence was six months in imprisonment. The other offender was charged with assault and battery on his wife. The offense was let go with a reprimand by the judge. The judge showed us by his comparative value, the value of those two kinds of property. Why don't we know more about these things? I mean, you know, I never knew such things actually happened. It is high time to compel man by the might of right to give woman her political, her local, legal, and social rights. She will find her own sphere in accordance with her capacities, her powers, and tastes. And yet, she will be a woman still. Away with the folly that her rights would be detrimental to her character. That if she were recognized as the equal of a man, she would cease to be a woman. Has his rights as a citizen of a republic, the elective franchise, and all the advantages so changed his nature that he ceases to be a man? Good point. You know, Women in the 20th century, those women were accused, they were ridiculed and being told that they were trying to be like men. Well, I hope they disabused them of that notion. I think they did. <laughs> I have one more question here, Mrs. Rose. What would you say is the signal most cause of the low status of women? Is there a single cause? The cornerstone of injustice Done women. The wrong idea from which all other wrongs proceed is this. She is not acknowledged as mistress of herself. From her cradle to her grave, she is a number. We do need and demand that all of the rights that we've spoken about are given women. But let us first obtain ourselves. Well said, Mrs. Rose. Thank you for coming to meet with me this evening. July 
took him and carried him home. But when I went to take off his clothes, there was his poor little back all covered with scars and hard lumps where they bought him. Did you always go by the name Sojourner? No, indeed. My name was Isabel. But when I left bondage, I left everything behind. And I went to the Lord, and I asked him to give me a new name. And he gave me a dream. Because I was too trapped. Then I said, Lord, give me another name. Because everybody else has two names. <laughs> and he gave me the truth. Because I was to tell the truth. Were you ever afraid? Were you ever thinking that maybe the people wouldn't listen? I went to camp meeting, and one night a pod of young men was hooting and hollering and calling much disturbed. I was afraid. I said to myself, I am the only colored person here. And unto me, their wicked mystery will fall first. And I went and hid behind a trunk in one of the tents. But then I thought, should I run away and hide from the devil, me, a servant of the living God? Have I not faith enough to go out and quell that mob? When I know it is written, one should take a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight. I know there's 
I've had a thousand years. And I know I'm a servant of the living God. I'll go to the rescue, and the Lord should go with me. So I walked to a small, dry ground and commenced to sing a hymn. And the young man came at me with clubs and sticks. And I ceased singing. I said, What do you come about me with sticks and clubs? I'm not doing harm to anyone. We are going to hurt you, old woman. We came to hear you sing. <laughs> Another thing. Talk to us, old woman. And I said to myself, here must be many young men bearing within them hearts susceptible of good impression. I will speak to them. And I did. I said, there are two congregations on this ground. It is written that there be a separation between the sheep and the goat. The other preachers have the sheep, and I have the goat. <laughs> this produced great fact. <laughs> I talked for a while till I was weary, and cast the bottle some way to get some food. I paused. And they shouted for more. I said, if I sing you one more hymn, will you then leave this place in peace? Yeah, yeah, okay. Speedily back from few. So I said, I repeat, and I want to answer from you all. If I sing one more, will you go away and leave us this night in peace? Yes, yes. Many voices came. But I say, I repeat my request once more. And I did. And this time, a long loud yes came up and I cried amen it is sick and before I was done they were running as fast as they well could in a solid body I can compare them to nothing but a small beast and was that it Later, I was told, as they reached the main road, a few rebels refused to go on. But their leader said, we all promise, all promise, we must go, all go, and none of you to return again. <laughs> Most of your life was spent preaching about the evils of slavery. But you also spoke out for women's rights. Tell me about that. Well, I figured this way. There was much stir about the colored men and their rights, but not a word about the colored women. If the colored men get their rights and not the colored women, you see, the colored men will be messed over the women, and it'll be just as bad as it was before. I want women to have their rights. In the court, women have no right, no voice, nobody speaks for them. I suppose I am the only colored woman who goes about to speak for the rights of colored women. I want to keep 
Now that I I says to men, what we want is a little money. When we get all right, we will not have to come to you for money. For then we shall have money enough in our own pocket. I used to work the field and men doing no more than I did. Got quite You have been having our reign for so long, you think? Like a slave master that you own. I know it is hard for one who held the reins for so long to give up. Now colored men have their have the right to vote. There ought to be equal rights now more than ever since colored people have got their freedom. Yes. Once at a suffrage meeting. Akron, Ohio, a man stood up and said, oh, the women are more delicate than men, and they need help throughout life, and they should be on a pedestal and stay within their own sphere. Men can then protect them and assist them. Do you remember what you said to him? Yes. I said, that man over there says women need to be helped into carriages and lifted <coughs> over ditches <coughs> and given the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages over ditches or gave me the best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at my own. I have plowed and planted and gathered in farm. No man eat me. And ain't I a woman? I can eat it, work as hard, and as eat, work as much, and eat as much as any man when I can get it. And bear the lash as well. I bore 13 children. Many mm, I've seen sold into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus has heard me. And ain't I a woman? Of my 